Hello, welcome to Radio Centralized, where today we're interviewing Jeremy Miller, who was the creator from his farm in Iowa of Jabber and uh, founded the startup Singly. And now he's working on Telehash. He's going to tell us all about it. Hello, Jeremy. Hello. Great to uh, great to be doing this. I'm excited. So, um, can you give us like a brief introduction to Telehash, or what it does? Um... So it's hard to do a brief introduction. Uh, Telehash is actually, you know, it's. I've been working on it specifically under that name for about five years now, and it was. It's for much of that lifetime, it's been just sort of a research project. Um, it, it was sort of born of a lot of the problems that, even back when the whole community of us were working on Jabber. Jabber was a federated model, but there was still a lot of desire to solve sort of the peer-to-peer -peer problems, and it didn't fit well within the Jabber architecture. Uh, so we never really got to play with that strongly uh, in that environment. And it was, you know, about the same time as Jabber was evolving, a lot of the distributed hash table research and a lot of experimentation um, was happening, you know, sort of out there in the real world. People were building apps with it. So. Like I said, about five years ago, I sort of came back to wanting to really take everything that had been learned about distributed hash tables and see if we can solve some of those original problems that we wanted to um, had wanted to do, you know, as part of Jabber, uh, in relation to how do you connect people peer to peer, how do you um, take care of the sort of the, the real time aspect of stuff going back and forth. Um, it, anyway. It, it became, a, uh, it evolved over the last five years. There's only been two versions of it implemented, so we're on version two right now. And the there's been probably a dozen different actual versions of the, the spec that have evolved. Uh, but this latest version has incorporated, um, as, sorry, this hasn't been very brief, but <laughs> the latest version of the spec okay. over the last six months has incorporated a lot of the strongest cryptographic protocols we can incorporate into it uh, because we realized that in building a communication system that it has to now natively from the very ground up uh, be private as well, that it has to incorporate privacy from the very essence of its DNA, not just as a layer on top. So that has been a, a big piece of the new version. Okay, and maybe to explain it, can you go, so from the point of view of an end user, I mean, perhaps a technical one, but then someone using applications built on top of it, what would it, what will it look like when it's finished? How, how does Telehash kind of feel and work? So the goal is to actually build a set of communication apps that a, a user doesn't necessarily know or see, uh, that anything special or different is happening, um, other than that there is some assurance and trust that when they're using the communication system, that they know that their messages and the things that they're sharing with somebody else are going straight to that other person. That they're not having to upload or share them with some other company mm -hmm. or on some site or some other server. That they know that it's going from their phone to the other person's phone. Or if the other person has like a, a photo sharing place that is coming back and forth from wherever they're sharing photos from. Um, and the same for like media streaming, audio, video. Uh, that we want that knowledge to be apparent to the person. But otherwise, they don't really see anything different. That we're trying to build the same set of you know, asynchronous and synchronous communication patterns, instant messaging, chat, sort of the mail style patterns, full social network patterns, um, <clears throat> it, all of the typical communication systems that you use apps and technology for can be built on top of Telehash again. So that's from the perspective of a user. From the perspective of a developer who's using and building something on top of Telehash, uh, the applications no longer need to care about um, host names or DNS or IP addresses or ports. All they have to care about is the fingerprint of the other endpoint they want to reach. Telehash actually takes care of turning that fingerprint into a network path, and it takes the shortest network path possible to get there. Uh, so that the perspective of the developer it tries to simplify everything uh, to just, I, need, I have a fingerprint of somebody I want to talk to, which we call a hash name, and I have data that I want to send back and forth, either an ongoing stream of data or just a one-time request with response. So this is using a, a distributed hash table stuff. Um, so I know lots of people don't know about or understand it yet. Can you kind of explain how that works, how it can send messages between two places without any intervening server getting hold of them? 
So the distributed hash table that Telehash is based on, since there's a number of different strong patterns out there, like rules of how to create distributed hash tables, the one Telehash is based on is called Catamlia. Uh, I think it's pronounced correctly. Um, so I've heard other people pronounce it. It's, it's been around for about 10 years now, and it's one of the simplest. Um, it, its its original design was sort of as a key value store, but Telehash doesn't use it that way. It only uses it to resolve other endpoints that I want to connect from one place to another, and the distributed hash table will help coordinate and find that other endpoint. And to explain how it works is actually, mm -hmm. there's no special math. All it is is an exclusive OR. So I have my identity, which is a SHA-256 hash, and I have the identity of somebody that I want to reach, which is their SHA-256 hash. I can find the distance between me and them by just doing an XOR of all of the bits. And usually, you know, the first couple bits are, you know, different, so the distance is very far. Uh, whereas so that's, kind of a, that's a distance in a kind of hash table space rather than any physical distance. Yep. And like any hash table, um, you're, you have to have seeds. So when I t first turn on, I have to go connect to somebody else in the distributed hash table. And how I find or how I resolve somebody else is I go to whoever I know that is closest to the one that I'm seeking. So I have a list of people I'm connected to. I sort them based on their distance from the hash name I'm trying to reach. And then I say, hey, do you know anybody? Do you know this hash name or do you know anybody closer? They do the same comparison of everybody they're connected to, and they give me back a list of whoever's closer. And it feels like that would be very brute force, except that Catamlia has a rule about how you keep a list of buckets of, and you try to keep connections open to people that are close to you so that you always have more knowledge of and more connections to other hash names that are near to you. So the queries will actually con uh, consecutively get closer and closer to their endpoint. Okay, um, and on a very kind of practical level, how are you getting around uh, various NAT and routing and firewalls and things to, for those communications? So I wanted to make sure that was completely built into and native to Telehash, not depending on any external service or any, any external um, provider for that. Uh, whenever you're connected to anybody else in the distributed hash table, they obviously, obviously know what your public IP and port is. And the act of, like, if I want to connect to you, uh, the act of connecting to you means I first search for your hash name, so I'm talking to somebody who actually is already connected to you or who knows you. And they say, hey, I know them. So I also say, and then they tell me what your public IP and port is, and I send you a little packet so that I can open a path from my net towards yours, which might not get there yet. But I also go back to them and say, hey, I'm trying to connect to this person, and they hand my information over to them so that they can then send uh, a packet that punches all the way through the NATs back to me. Oh, so once you've made the connection with Kademlia, you then have a direct connection between the two parties who are talking? The goal, is that? yes. The goal is that every hash name is connected directly. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, and the cryptography that you're using, uh, you said you've done lots of work recently on, on, on improving that. Um, yep. Uh, so everything, all of the packets sent on the wire are always encrypted to the recipient uh, so that nobody else can actually, I mean, anybody sort of recording anything off the wire can't actually see anything um, just by recording the traffic. And we actually use uh, two patterns of encryption. One is just for identity. So we're using RSA to identify what the hash name is a fingerprint of your RSA key so the, the other side can sort of assert and say, yes, I am this person, and they can sign you know, the request uh, to guarantee who they are, and that you can encrypt a secret so that only they can decrypt. That's actually not used for the content that's sent back and forth. Uh, once the identity is exchanged and verified, um, there's it's basic forward secrecy using elliptic curve uh, Diffie-Hellman, such that you, each side creates a session key on a, a temporary elliptic curve, and um, then they use Diffie-Hellman to derive a shared secret, and they use AES uh, from that shared secret. I mean, there's a lot more steps involved in this, but at a high level, mm. um, all of the content is actually sent uh, encrypted over with, using temporary keys, such that if something was recorded and cracked at any later point, it would only decrypt that session 
as well okay. as if either side was compromised, you couldn't actually decrypt the traffic, even if you were able to compromise the keys. And something that people always worry about with this is the uh, metadata analysis, just learning things from the fact that people are even talking to each other at all. Does, does any of this kind of distributed hashing stuff help with that? Or? Uh, it, it helps in that because of the function of Catamlia and a distributed table, distributed hash table itself, that you have many, many hash names that you're connected to and talking with all the time because you're exchanging queries and basically status updates. So there is it, it's not intentional like to try and create you know fake mm. traffic patterns, but just the nature of using the distributed hash table does create uh, a lot of you know sort of random network traffic back and forth. Um, but it, the real goal of Telehash here isn't to try and create an anonymous network. It's to preserve, um, it's to create a network that people can use to communicate with the people they know. Uh, it, you know, you're instant messaging mm -hmm. with your friends and your family and you're sharing photos to family members. You might be talking to work members. Uh, and there's, I mean, we're doing a lot of work to make sure that, you know, the Internet of Things can support Telehash supports them just as well, so that mm. when I have a bunch of sensors and devices and computers around me, that I can talk to them directly. Uh, so this, it isn't about anonymizing traffic. It's actually almost the inverse. It's about creating a trusted path to the people that you know. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, so I'm always find the resilience aspects really interesting as well as uh, the privacy ones. So things like if there was a hurricane or if the servers went down of, of a central server, then presumably the packets get routed directly peer-to-peer. -peer yeah, th that's actually one of the exciting things that has been one of the design principles from the beginning, and one of the things that you know I was disappointed that Jabber couldn't do as easily, um, is that in a sort of a disaster scenario, uh, or any sort of wherever you the network is might not be reliable or trusted or might block things at a higher level, um, that because everything travels peer to peer, as long as you can establish, you know, a connection with somebody else locally, you can actually exchange and communicate with them, and they can, you know, help connect anybody else's locally. So the the hash table itself will reform with whatever network connectivity is available, as well as we're designing the we call them switches, the ones that actually handle the crypto and do all the network traffic that an application sort of um, embeds into it. Is that the switches should be able to take advantage of in a phone. Uh, mm -hmm. ideally both the cell can, the cell network as well as the Wi-Fi network and be a, and to know basically I mean the goal is to know every network path available to another hash name such that if one doesn't work you can fall back to another okay. and I'd love for someday when the neighborhood networks uh, sort of you know start to increase uh, that the neighbor, neighborhood network is yet another path that any you know, local application can then use to connect to anybody else. Okay. Um, so in terms of take up, like how much response have you had? Are there any good applications running? And what's your kind of plan to increase that number and get people to be able to use it? So the current status is that we're the version two is basically um, has been developed over the last six months or so, and we're implementing. We have a couple of core implementations of that that are, I would say, quite unstable yet. Uh, so we're not sort of in the production mode where people are using it on a day-to-day -day basis, but we have about a dozen people that are sort of involved in helping um, implement it in various different languages and environments and sort of getting those some real-world testing and real-world experience to make sure that all the nat hole punching works, to make sure the sort of the heuristics of how to maintain the distributed hash table work well, um, make sure that all of the implementations uh, work well with each other. So we're at the early implementation stage. And mm -hmm. I we have some sort of test chat and test um, messaging apps that we've built on top of it. Um, but we're just getting to the point now where we're going to start to build um, some, some things that people who aren't as technical can start to play with and experiment with. Yeah. So particularly since we, well, Jabber is used by millions, hundreds of millions of people, actually, potentially. And are there any lessons you've learned from that as to how you can get adoption of, of a new system like this in a way that's usable for everyone? Well, the biggest, uh, I think the biggest lesson is to take your time and, and you know, don't try and rush it. Like, do, do things well. Um, that the, 
adoption comes through having done it well, like having provided and created something that isn't just temporary, that actually has a lot of infrastructure and support and community uh, behind it. Um, so we're, we're trying to do that, and this is going to be a, a many-year project. Uh, it already has been many years, mm. but getting this sort of to scale is going to take many more years. Um, so it's it's not about trying to get some app that has you know hundreds of millions of users on it. Mm. It's about creating some really open infrastructure and a lot of implementations of it, such that it can become embedded in lots of other places. So it's kind of the opposite of the startup that just sits parasitically on top of something. It's like a whole new thing, like the web that provides resources and infrastructure and capability to people. Yeah, and I think a lot of um, a lot of what all of us that are working on it are trying to do is just demonstrate that this is possible. You know, even even if somebody looks at Telehash and says, "Oh, this is great," you know, I can build something on top of it, and they maybe they're just inspired by it. They don't actually use Telehash. They're just like, okay, I can actually do a distributed app um, and use these different technologies. That's great. Like we're trying to demonstrate mm. that it's possible to actually build all these communication networks that obey privacy, obey the intention of the user using it, uh, and have all of the same features, if not more, than the existing apps that are centralized. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Is there anything else you want to say, particularly anything that people watching can do or help contribute? So if what would be wonderful is people who are interested in this um, that are sort of in the developer low-level system side, uh, getting the core implementations working well, it would be great to have you know, anybody who's interested in this kind of stuff um, and who likes to like dabble with crypto and network sockets and you know low-level system things, it just, you know, hit telehash.org, hit me up. Um, I'm pretty easy to track down on the internet. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeremy. That's fantastic. And good, good luck with it. I hope it, you, you succeed in building it. Yeah, I hope you know all of us who are working in distributed technology uh, I, I think are going to make a difference in the long run here. So mm. I'm excited to be just part of that larger community. Mm, definitely.